All right, we're going to look at another constrained optimization problem. So it doesn't say constrained optimization when you read the word problem, um, but we want to find the points on a sphere. Here's a restriction or constraint closest to, so here's what we want to minimize, uh, something about being close, so a distance here. All right, so we want to find points. So we're going to find x, y, z. And we want to minimize a distance formula. Minimize the distance from this arbitrary unknown point, x, y, z, to this other point. So I'm just going to write down a distance formula here. Uh, and so I can either do x minus 1 or 1 minus x, the quantity squared. I'll do x minus 1. All right, so I want to minimize this function uh, with the restriction that x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 36. Okay, so constrained optimization. Here's our constraint, and here's what we want to optimize, in this case, minimize a function. All right, so this is uh, ideal for Lagrange multipliers as a method. When we do Lagrange multipliers, we need to think about an objective function. That's what we want to maximize or minimize. And I could use this for my objective function, but I will need to take derivatives of it. And so might think through a step or two of that. The derivatives of this function, partial derivatives of this function, get pretty ugly. So we might be a little creative about that objective function and just thinking a little bit about it before you just plow right into this and do some horrible algebra. Uh, if the algebra is getting too horrible, you might have chosen a bad path through the problem. So that's something just to kind of be aware of. Um, so here I've got a distance formula, square root of something. The square root function is a strictly increasing function. If you just think back to kind of calc 1 or basic function behavior, square root function is strictly increasing, which means that when the input for the square root function gets bigger, so does the output. So this function will be maximized when the inside part here, the input of the square root function, or this whole expression inside the radical, is maximized. So I'm going to use this for my objective function. And in Lagrange's theorem, it calls the objective function f of x, y, z. So I'm going to use that label here, too. And I'm just going to use this inside of the radical. The distance will be maximized when the inside of the radical is maximized. So there's the objective function. And then I need a constraint function. So in Lagrange's theorem, you want the constraint as a function of x, y, z equal to 0. So here's our constraint, and I will need to move some terms one side to the other so that I can think about that constraint as being equal to 0. Okay, um, and then Lagrange's theorem says that if this objective function does have extrema subject to the constraint, they will occur at values that satisfy the system of equations given by gradient of f equals lambda times gradient of g. I'm going to jump right to those equations you get from that, from looking at each component. Before I jump into the equations, though, I just want to think a little bit about what this question is asking. We need points that are on a sphere. This is a sphere centered at the origin of radius 6, closest to a point. And this point would be inside the sphere. If you just visualize sphere, center at the origin, radius 6, this point would be inside the sphere. And so you should be able to visualize that and see that there would be a point on that sphere that's closest to this point, 1, 2, 2. And there would also be a point 
directly opposite that on the sphere that would be farthest from that point 1, 2, 2. So this function does have extrema uh, subject to this constraint, just thinking through the geometry of what it's asking us to do here. So we should expect that we will get solutions to that system of equations that do, uh, do what we're looking for here. Um, all right, so we're going to set up that system of equations. And in the last example, I wrote down some vectors and then pulled the components out of those vectors and really worked with those component by component equations. So I'm just going to go straight to that part this time. That's usually what I start with. So the gradient of f will have components 2 times the quantity x minus 1. And I'm just going to kind of stack these so that I get my system of equations here. So this would be the i component for gradient of f. And then the j component would be 2 times the quantity y minus 2, so the partial derivative of this function with respect to y. And then the k component, partial derivative of f with respect to z, 2 times z minus 2. So these are the components of gradient of f. And then those should be equal to lambda times the components of gradient g. So partial derivative of g with respect to x is 2x. Partial derivative of g with respect to y is 2y. And partial derivative of g with respect to z is 2z. OK, so these are the equations that come from the components of gradient of f equals lambda times gradient of g. Again, I have three equations for unknowns, so I need a fourth equation. The constraint equal to 0 is the fourth equation that you need. I'm going to go ahead and add 36 back to both sides. Um, the real reason you need that equal to 0 is so that you can think about this as a level surface of a function of three variables. That's how the theorem is stated. But when you're doing the algebra, you may want to rearrange some terms there. All right, so this is the system that I need to solve. Uh, in the last example that we did, we were able to solve for x in some equations and divide through, uh, actually, I think, we, yeah, we solved for x, y, and z. We divided through by something involving lambda. Um, we do have to be a little bit more careful here. If we think about this problem, I need points on a sphere. And those points on that sphere could have an x-coordinate, y-coordinate, or z-coordinate of 0. So in this particular problem, x, y, or z could be 0. And if x, y, or z is 0, then that forces some other uh, restrictions as well. So I have to be careful about dividing through by variables here. So I'm going to do some different algebra. And students sometimes are not comfortable with this at first, but once you see it and what happens with it, you'll understand why that's a helpful strategy to use. So what I'm going to do here is instead of isolating a variable and use substitution as a technique for solving, I'm going to use elimination as a strategy for solving. I'm going to notice that on all three of these equations, the right-hand side is almost the same. Um, in this first equation, if I multiplied this first equation through by y and z, if I multiplied the first equation through by y and z, and the second equation through by x and z, and the third equation through by x and y, then the right-hand sides would be the same, which would mean I can set the left-hand sides equal to each other. So that's one thing you can do. I'm also going to just do this pair by pair and kind of work with two equations at a time. Uh, to make some things happen. So similar idea, but just two equations at a time. So I'm going to work with these first two equations. And if I multiply the first equation through by y and the second equation through by x, then the right-hand sides will be equal. And so then that means that the left-hand sides would have to be equal as well. So just to save space, uh, instead of writing out many steps here of actually multiplying those through and then noticing that the right-hand sides are equal so I can set the left-hand sides equal, I'm going to just go ahead and set those left-hand sides equal. All right, so I will have y times 2 times x minus 1 will be 2y times x minus 1. 
and the left hand side here will be 2x times y minus 2. Okay, and so there's a lot of different algebra I can do here. Be careful with the algebra that you're doing and be clear what's happening. As long as you're not dividing through by a variable that could be zero, so not dividing through by x or y or even this quantity x minus 1 or the quantity y minus 2, then your algebra will help you get the answer. So uh, what I'm going to do here is notice that if I distribute through these parentheses, I will get some like terms. So if I distribute through those parentheses, I'll notice that I have some like terms, 2xy terms on both sides of the equation. And I'm not going to divide through by them. What I'm actually going to do is subtract from both sides of the equation. So you don't need to write this out, but you should be thinking carefully about what the algebra is that's allowing you to cross things out. So I'm subtracting 2xy from both sides of the equation. So then I'm left with negative 2y equals negative 4x. And I can isolate either x or y. Uh, so I could write y equals 2x. All right, so that's not my answer, but that would allow me to eliminate a variable if I substitute that into my constraint. All right, so if I repeat this same process with another pair of equations, either the x and z equation or the y and z equations, then I can find a relationship similarly, either between x and z or between y and z, and then use my constraint at the end. So this strategy, when, you can, when you're tempted to divide through by a variable and you really want to divide through by a variable, but you know you shouldn't, this strategy of making one side of the equation the same so that you can set the other sides of the equation equal is a good strategy that will often help you through the problem. So I'm going to do that again, uh, and I will do that this time with the y and z equations. So uh, if I want the right-hand side of the y and z equations to be the same, I'm going to multiply this second equation through by z this time, and the third equation through by y. All right, so do that work down here. So on the left side, I will have 2z times the quantity y minus 2 equals the right side, which is going to be equal to the right side on the other equation, which is equal to 2y times the quantity z minus 2. And again, be careful with the algebra here. I'm going to distribute through and then do some subtracting from both sides of the equation, not dividing through both sides of the equation. All right, so 2zy or 2yz minus 4z equals 2yz minus 4y. I'm going to subtract 2yz from both sides. And again, you don't have to write that, but you should be thinking about that algebra that's allowing you to cross some things out here. Um, so then I'm left with negative 4z equals negative 4y, or if I divide through by negative 4, then I get z equals y. Okay, so I've got some relationships here between x and y and z and y. So I'm going to use those and substitute into my constraint, and then I'll be able to find some answers here. So since I have everything here related to y, what I'm going to do is write my constraints completely in terms of y. All right, so I have here y equals 2x, but then that means x equals 1 half y. if I want everything in terms of y. So in place of x, I'm going to put 1 half y. Do that work over here. It's going into the constraint. And then y, I'm just going to leave as y. And then in place of the z, I'll put what z is equal to. Equals 36. And then just do this algebra here. Um, so this becomes 1 fourth y squared plus 1y squared plus 1y squared is 9 fourths y squared equals 36. Um, multiply both sides by 9 fourths. And let's see if I can do the arithmetic without messing that up. Uh, 16, right? Uh, OK, so I get y equals plus or minus 4. y equals plus or minus 4. 
All right, so when y is plus or minus 4, we're going to get different values for x here as well. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Y equals plus or minus 4. I want to make sure my answer was correct before I went on. Plus or minus 4. All right, so um, when y equals 4, we're going to have one set of values for x and z. And then y is negative 4, we'll have another set of values for x and z. So our points that satisfy this relationship, when y is 4, x will be 1 half of that, so 2, and z will be the same. So that's one of our points when y is positive 4. And then when y is negative 4, x will be 1 half of that, so negative 2, and z will be the same as y. So negative 4. So I have two points here that fell out of the algebra that we were working on here. And we need to think about which of those satisfies what we're looking for here. So you can substitute into the constraint, uh, or into the objective function, and determine which of these maximizes and which of these minimizes. Or you can think about the geometry. So we talked a little bit about the geometry at the beginning of this video. We want to find the points on the sphere a sphere of radius 6 centered at the origin that are closest to this point which is in the first octant. So if you visualize that you should be able to see which of these actually minimizes this distance and then that the other one that's exactly opposite that on the other side of the sphere maximizes that distance. So this one that's also in the first octant would be the one that minimizes the distance. This one's closer to 1, 2, 2, and this one is. So this is the point. Um, so in terms of justification, if you were going to justify why this is your answer instead of this, you could talk about that geometry. You could look at a graph or draw a graph. You could also calculate the distance from this point to 1, 2, 2, and this point to 1, 2, 2, and show that this distance is smaller. Um, I will just say here, based on the geometry, is how we know that this is the point that minimizes that distance and this would be the point that maximizes the distance. Okay, so we will look at some more examples. Uh, some of the other examples have a lot more algebra, so uh, they become a lot more messy. Um, but it's just a matter of kind of getting through the algebra every time. I would suggest that you do watch those other videos and not decide that after a couple videos you have this because the algebra can get kind of creative uh, and those other videos show you some algebra that you may not have really thought about before. When you do algebra in your algebra classes, they're often much simpler equations and you certainly don't have this letter lambda in there that you're dealing with. So. Um, I would suggest that you watch those videos before you try too much homework. Also, I would remind you that if your algebra is starting to feel really horrible, it probably means that you've chosen a bad path through the problem. It might be a correct path, but a very difficult path through the problem, and there was probably an easier way. So watch some videos and make sure that you're kind of thinking about the easiest way through these problems. And be sure to send me questions if you have questions about any of them as well.